have the great pleasure of announcing our panel um, leader, Ash, who's given me a get out of jail free card to not mispronounce his name and said, I can just call him Ash. So Ash, if I can welcome you. I love the name of your company, Uptake. Um, one of the things that that brings to mind for me is the whole, to go a little bit back to the innovation discussion and that's, and, and I think this is what you guys will be talking about, I hope, because I think it's such a valuable discussion, but the whole concept of user adoption. And if we look at user adoption as a behavioural change rather than a technology user adoption, perhaps there's something in the words user adoption that the techie guys could take a look at and say to themselves, well, really what we're after is to change people's behaviours to use this new technology. So um, just to make sure that I don't get anything wrong here, analyze, adapt, and overcome how miners can build an integrated and effective digital strategy into their operations. I think that's one of the biggest challenges facing not just mining, but any industry today. Ash is the Director of Portfolio and Industry Strategy, Manufacturing and Mining at uptake. He has a huge AI background, has worked with startups, and is now really working with CIOs and CTOs. I feel bad about my comment earlier, but CTOs who are implementing digital change in their business. Welcome to the stage, Ash. Thanks, Ben. Good morning. All right, you can hear me. I wasn't sure if this is going to work. All right, my name is Ash, and um, I'm going to host this panel, um, Analyze, over Adapt, and Overcome, with some of the most respected and successful executives from the mining industry who have successfully led the strategy and implementation of what we call digital transformation of the industry for their organization. And when it comes to digital transformation, we are at a, such an interesting point in the industry where we have now come down from the hype and fear, and we are slowly converging towards a curiosity about how to make it successful. All right, we have heard great things about AI. We have heard some, some bad stories about what can go wrong with AI. But now where, where do we actually end up? Because this is not going to go away. This is something that has happened to us already. It doesn't matter what, I, what do I think about it. It's going to happen to me. Okay. Uh, ask me, let me ask some questions about how to make it successful, how to make sure that I don't fail in the implementation of those technologies. And it's not the first time that we, as a, as a human society, we are making those assumptions and, and reflections about the technology. If we go back to the history, um, all the innovations and inventions, including industrial revolution, invention of electricity and everything, they have been phased with such reaction from the audience. Underwhelming responses, sometimes ridiculing. Can we move the slide, please? So this was the, the first motion picture that Lumiere Brothers invented. They invented the cinematography and, well, thank you. And they announced and invited the people from Paris to first witness the first motion picture of the world. And it was the time, late 19th century, when Paris and many other cities in the world, they were full with snake charmers, beer fighters, magicians, acrobats. So they were definitely looking forward to something that they say moving images. It was also the time when electricity was just invented and Paris was turned into the city of light. It was also the time when the automobiles were passing by the horse carts, and it was also the time when industrial revolution actually changed the whole manufacturing narrative. So a Parisian might be forgiven for expecting too much from this, for expecting that anything can happen on any given night, because anything was actually happening on any given night. So sure enough, there was a huge response to this first screening of the motion picture by Lumiere Brothers. And at the end of this movie, when the lights were turned on in the hall, people were stacked on each other. They were so terrified by the train coming. Now you can imagine today that the cinema industry 
including the streaming content on your mobile device that you cannot live without when you fly. It's a $250 billion industry. The first movie you just saw, it's $250 billion industry. So you can imagine Lumiere Brothers might have made a good fortune out of it. Three years down the line after they did this, they were done. In his own words, Auguste Lumiere said, cinema is a technological innovation which has no future. Nothing can be farther from the truth. We now, we now know that. But the history has not been kind to all the inventors, including the, Charles, the, the invention by Charles Babbage, who actually invented the, the world's first computing machine 100 years before Alan Turing did it during World War II. But that was a different time. We did not have electricity. We used to power that machine with the steam engines. He made that design, and nobody took him seriously for 100 years. Recently, that machine has been brought to life, and it is a fully functional computing machine, really beautiful. Similarly, we as a human society, we took fire as a technology to keep us warm and make some funny images on the cave walls. We never truly understood the potential of technology. That's our basic nature. That's how we see things all the time. When we are in the middle of change, when we are in the middle of something, we don't truly really appreciate what it can do for us. Right after this, Lumiere brothers, when they showed the, the train experiment, oops, when they showed the train experiment, 10 years it took for one close-up technology to show up, 10 full years. Hundreds of workers, hundreds of people working on that technology. The technology that already existed, it took 10 years for a close-up shot to come in, into the life. The point I'm trying to make is that technology itself, which was pre-existing, it doesn't do anything unless there is someone out there who is willing to believe in it, who is willing to animate it, and who is willing to do iterations on it. Nothing happens with technology. The fire remains a tool to keep us warm and make funny shadows. I am fortunate and honored to host this panel with the people that have animated the technology. The people, those who have believed in it, have done it multiple times over, and they are willing to share their success stories, their failure stories, and the learnings that they have taken from it. Ladies and gentlemen, Please put your hands together and join me in welcoming today's guest speakers, Tians from Nutrien, Afzal from Vale, Kalev from Tech, and Bert from Freeport. Thank you for joining, all of you. Um, we'll just get started. Tians, my first question to you. Starting from an overall digital strategy standpoint, when you try to lay out an architecture of how do you think of digital strategy for the operation, how do you define this strategy? Thanks, uh, everyone, and uh, it's great to be here today. And uh, thank you, Ash, for putting that question straight on me. Um, um, so I think, you know, when you think about a digital strategy for us, um, digital has been treated as, uh, or technology has been treated as technology as a silver shiny thing uh, in a lot of industries and, and, and certainly where I come from. Um, what we decided to do uh, in Nutrien is take a step back and, and go and ask our operations first of all. What are the things that will make your life easier? How will we go about that? Now, we did a lot of, uh, I suppose, industry research looking at what are some of the major trends within our industry and in other industries uh, that we can, I suppose, adopt. Um, the, the thing to be careful of, and I think there's been a lot of discussion about this this morning, is not just to take technology because it's the latest thing. The organization needs to be ready for it. Um, and, you know, really the way we looked at the digital strategy for us was engaging significantly with our operations, with our tech services groups, 
uh, and understanding what is it that they need. Um, and you'd be surprised, they might call it something different, but a lot of them are working on a lot of these things in pockets already. And we took that, uh, you know, put some of the buzzwords on it, um, and formed that into a strategy, um, and look forward to, to dig a little bit deeper into to what that actually means today. Great. And, and when you define that with keeping the real problems in mind and the operational aspect, how do you really operationalize this strategy? How do you put structure in place? Um, I think from, from an operationalization perspective, uh, you, you need to understand uh, who is going to be using this technology. I think there's a notion that uh, in our technology function or your IT function should be leading a lot of this work and you know, no disrespect to any other the IT folks in the room. Uh, but I do think that um, sitting with the operations and making sure that they lead and own the implementation and not only own it, but own the value creation of that technology is, is hugely important. If you don't do that, the skin in the game is not there in my experience. Um, so I think for us to operationalize it, get yourself an operations lead, make sure that they lead the technology, own the value that's created, but make sure that those support functions like IT, like your you know, engineering and, and technology or IT functions are very much included uh, and supporting this. Technology at the end of the day is an enabler. It is not going to be your silver bullet. It's not going to replace your operations. It's going to enable your operations to be better and more efficient. Very well said. Uh, Bert, my next question to you is, uh, how has your operating model changed since you started implementing digital in Freeport, Mike Mara. Yeah, so, so thank you, Ash. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, we've spent a, a long time kind of developing the building blocks um, for, our, for our operations with sort of a, a vision in mind that said, if, if we invest appropriately with a long-term vision, um, and I, I appreciate Pam's slides because they really rang true, you know, you can't solve today's problem by looking out 10 years, but you sh sure can create sort of a guiding star, a North Star, and then work with your teams and your operations teams to evaluate what they need to get done and what the appropriate technology use is to, to allow them to get to that in the shortest, most appropriate amount of time. Also, creating ownership for that next step, almost an MVP, but keeping in mind the platforms that you wanna move towards um, allowing that next step and next step to be an investment um, in, in being able to pull forward new initiatives as they come up. Um, there's, there's a gentle balance there because too often technologists can get enamored with the tools or the vendors uh, and too often operations guys can be short-sighted and we really look at our job as trying to uh, work with both those teams to, to both understand the long-term vision and the short-term vision and to compromise where necessary, um, getting an MVP and iterating and moving towards that North Star. That's very well said. Um, I know that you are trying to simplify what you have done um, and it might not be as easy as you make it look like. What, did you face any challenges and what were those and what did you learn from them? Sure, the, the challenges are really, really huge because often, uh, as was mentioned many times here, you know, it's hard to recruit someone from Silicon Valley that wants to go sit in an operation. They might do it for a week or two, but we all know these are really complicated businesses, um, complicated operations, and to really understand that you need to participate. So that's one real, real challenge. And the other side is an appreciation from the operations teams who often work very remotely and move around the world, but somewhat in isolation to technology, and they see what's happening in the world and they want a piece of it, so they're gonna, they're gonna trust whoever brings them a solution. So if, if, if as an organization, the technology organization and the <coughs> operational improvement organization isn't moving fast enough, there will be solutions that come and, and they may not be in alignment with the North Star. So, so really getting all those things, being heard, making sure they're on a roadmap, and then working in conjunction with the groups to kind of prioritize investment um, and have it be their decision, right? IT can't make the decision. Operational improvement can't make the decision. Operations, we need to all do it as a team. And what we found is by going through that process, the take up 
in the business and the alignment has, has been really powerful. Yeah, that, that, that's right. Um, so, so Kalev, is it Kalev or Kalev? Oh gosh, your, your wonderful pronunciation. Perfect. <laughs> so, so my next question to you. So Bert mentioned about uh, the short-term problems and the long-term uh, challenges and how to make a platform and a roadmap where you not only solve today's problems but also thinking about the future. So in your opinion, across the mining value chain end-to-end, -end, what are the key pain points that you see and what, what is new technologies like AI, data science can, can help, help them with? I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question because if we look very long term, and how many of you have seen the movie Avatar, you know, the, the blue people who run around and there's a huge mining complex on a planet, mining unobtainium at uh, 200 uh, or, or $2 million a kilogram, right? And, and if you look at that, it's 250 years in the future. People are, are involved in interstellar travel. Um, they have energy beams that are basically can rip apart planets. Um, and yet, when you actually look at the mining operation, there are still yellow trucks driving around with drivers. <laughs> and the only, the, o the only attribute they have is that, that they have missiles mounted on them so that they can have sort of a license to operate. And you know, I mean, that, that's sort of a, a real problem with the vision of the future. And as you said, you know, you really, you really do have to have a vision of the future to actually reach it. And if that's our vision of the future, then certainly that's not a, a, a very pleasant one for anybody concerned. So um, I think that the long-term one actually has to incorporate some kind of view of mind of the future within a, maybe a 10-year time span. And that becomes your goal. And in the short term, and at Tech, we've instituted a program called Race 21. That's a renew, automate, connect, and empower, um, and in a very aggressive schedule to 2021. And what's different is the scope and scale. We're doing it at all operations. Um, what we had done in the past was actually point solutions, fairly small scale, at operations, using AI, I think, pretty successfully in most cases, um, using a, a lot of uh, business intelligence fairly well in most cases. But in this program, it's across all sites, and it, it really focuses on the high value returns, uh, particularly in process control, particularly in, uh, uh, in areas of maintenance, uh, which are, are reasonably well understood uh, in terms of solutions, and, um, and also in terms of operating from end to end, uh, drill and blast. So you know, these, are, these are areas that do provide high value uh, capability. A second prong of this attack is actually to create an innovation environment where the corporation actually funds an innovation fund for um, uh, basically uh, um, ground level up innovations to occur. It's called Ideas at Work. Um, we have a, it's a fairly, it's a very large fund and, and this year we've uh, inspired um, uh, up to 20 projects that have actually yielded fairly significant results in dust control, in safety, uh, in electrifying uh, vehicles. And, and so, you know, I think that, that there's a, a, a number of different approaches. One is, sh one is reasonably short term, 2021, very structured um, and, and very aggressive in terms of scope and scale. The other one being far more aspirational, but, but very clear. And then actually, um, uh, in terms of scale, from bottom to top. And uh, the top is very, very committed, even in this cost-constrained environment. Interesting. So, uh, Afzal, next question to you. Um, so, Kalev mentioned about uh, all the sites come together for a uh, reasonably short-term 2021 strategy. Um, Wale is also a multi-site uh, operation, and you have a central role of implementing technology, thinking about technology, in-house data science team and everything. How do you assign responsibilities? How do you define what's the HQ role and what is the site role, and how do you make it efficient from an operational perspective? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's probably a challenge that I think many of us are, uh, are facing. I think my colleagues have talked to it uh, a little bit. Uh, fundamentally, I think it's absolutely imperative that the organization have an overarching strategy that basically describes 
what are the business outcomes that we want to achieve as an organization as a whole. I think without that, you end up with very site-specific or asset-specific solutions, and you don't necessarily get the opportunities to, to scale them for the benefits of, of, the, of the enterprise. So we started at Valet with articulating what are those broader aspirations, what are the business outcomes and objectives we want to achieve. And then from there, we defined what are the priority themes that would unlock that value and enable those, those outcomes. And by outcomes, they need to be clear for the business areas. What are the targets associated with safety, with productivity, with maintenance, et cetera? Whatever targets are, are appropriate, those are things that we need to, need to aspire towards. We then worked, as my colleagues had, had also mentioned, we, we've worked with the operational areas because ultimately digital hits the ground in the operations, right? The value is delivered there. And so whatever it is we're doing, uh, as an organization needs to be relevant for them. And so what we did is we worked to define around those macro themes, ultimately what were the priorities and what were the roadmaps for each specific operation and recognizing that each operational area or sub-segment of the business is going to be at a different level of maturity. They're gonna have a different set of business outcomes that they specifically are trying to achieve. I mean, at Valet as an example, you know, an underground mining operation in North Atlantic is going to have very, very different challenges and outcomes that are relevant to it versus open pit mining uh, iron ore in the north of Brazil in a highly, uh, where you have very high grades. Right? So our role really is to define what are those macro themes that stitch the, the initiatives together to try and coordinate that work, but more importantly to try and get benefits of scale as well as coordinated experimentation, right? So to come together as a group to say, hey, we want to try autonomous uh, mining as an example. Well, let's try this technology in the north of Brazil. Let's try this one in the south of Brazil, as opposed to each, each asset defining what they want to achieve and what the solutions are that are going to allow them to, to achieve those things in isolation. So that's one aspect. I think another role that we play, which is fundamental, we think of our role um, and the operating model almost as an innovation network. And our role as the digital transformation team is really to act as the wiring of that network, to connect the nodes of the operations to be able to share those best practices, commonality of, of strategy, and again, to enable those, those platforms to, to scale. And just a follow-up question about uh... You said that instead of each asset asking for one particular solution that makes sense for them, let's have a unified approach towards the north side of operation is this experimentation, the south side is this experimentation. How do you manage between the pull and the push? It's like getting a request from a site about that we need this technology, we need this, that's a pull request, rather than a push and say, hey, you know what? This is where Vale is going. This is what we should try. And would you like to try it? So how do you manage between push and pull? I, I think it's that gentle balance that was, was discussed, right? I think once you have the credibility with the operations, once you have their trust, there is a willingness to receive a little bit more push. But it starts with the pull. Correct. Right. Right? Um, you, you, you can't take the approach of simply going there and saying, we're going to push this agenda. You need to understand what's relevant to them and make sure that you're accelerating that value for them. That gives you the license to, to push a little bit more. And I think the extent to which you can demonstrate the value associated with that push accelerates that, that buy-in. Yeah. So, so Kali, you, you mentioned about your race 21 project, and I, I know it's still in the works. Um, and you have implemented several initiatives already. What, is, what are your views about how to make an implementation successful? So Afzal mentioned something about that the push and pull, uh, it might not work if you don't handle it well. So when you start implementing a new technology or new solution at a site on certain operation, how do you make sure that it's going to be successful, that you have the necessary trust to, to deliver that? I think uh, the U.S. Uh, Constitutional Congress gives a good, uh, good example of, uh, of push and pull. Um, you know, it, it's always a, a, a huge um, 
negotiation. It's not a negotiation in fact, but it is actually, that's what it really comes down to. Um, but what's fundamental to all of Race 21 is actually achieving EBITDA value. So these are very, very strict goal, goals in our company that we achieve 150 million EBITDA by the end of the year from this program, that we achieve other milestones in the next two years, and that for uh, you know, building QB2 in Chile, that uh, remains a, 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 a primary focus for our company, and that incorporates many of these uh, capabilities. But it's the ability to, for the operations to agree that they will achieve this value. I mean, IT does not achieve the value. OT does not achieve the value. And so, um, uh, and the other piece that we put in place 10 years ago was that IT and OT, there is no, there is no IT and OT. There's just digital um, operations. And from that point on, the digital operations live at site. The sites include them as their team. They provide all the support for all of their capabilities at the site, where essentially we provide the overall capability. But their, their faces to the capability of technology at the site. And that has made a huge difference, because the people who are operating the mine actually see them as part of their team, even though it's a very uniform um, operation across all of tech. So every truck has the same computer, every truck is part of the same network, all our, all our uh, process plants are connected. So everything has been connected over the last 10 years and now is the push to actually achieve the value from all of that underlying, underlying foundation. But there's a lot of renewal associated with that as well. But it's a very strict accounting for EBITDA. How much is this going to help us in the next year, two years, three years? And it's very interesting to actually watch this discussion because, um, I mean, the sites are obviously saying, well, I can't do without, you know, five people or six people, and yet they will have to. And if the technology isn't meeting that demand, then, you know, I think that as a company, we haven't actually done the job right. We haven't done the architecture right, and we haven't provided the, the correct amount of process control or the correct amount of automation, or closing the loop on the automation to actually give us value. or understanding what the value is between silos. So I think that it all comes down to actually um, having a mutual understanding of value. The second, but even more important, actually the most important piece is, is the issue that you brought up, trust. Without trust, absolutely none of this happens. And the trust is built on incremental uh, capability adding value. So for example, in our, in our maintenance shop where we, add, we put in our um, our uh, uh, predictive maintenance pro uh, program, the machine learning program. The superintendent who actually brought and scheduled maintenance for the trucks sees a whole screen of alarms every day. And, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a desire to put in a whole new interface, you know, red, red green, blue, there was, I think there was even a purple light that went on for this particular capability. What we ended up doing was, and, and this was, was his suggestion, was, well, just give me an alarm, highlight it in some way, like make it a little brighter yellow, that this is coming from the machine learning piece, and, and that's sufficient, because that's part of my process. So it was a really ugly interface, but it really worked well. And in one case where, a truck, where it actually said, well, this truck will fail with a high probability within the next 24 hours, the truck was brought into the shop, uh, the, the electricians looked it over, they said, nope, this is fine send it back. That's a minus for trust. About two hours later, the machine learning program again said, this truck will fail with a high probability within 12 hours. The superintendent believed it, brought it in, and they found a sort of a half million dollar fault on the truck. A potential half million dollars repair. So these kinds of things build trust. And, and you know, if you can build more and more trust, um, you, know, you get pulled more and more. That's super interesting, and you, you mentioned machine learning. I can't stop myself from saying something. Um, is that it's, it's super important in, to close the loop yep. in the machine learning, telling the algorithm you did the job right or you did the job wrong, and that closing the loop is, I, I think, is the, one of the most important part of writing the algorithm, and that's what we try to do uh, at Uptake is, uh, and that starts from trust, like how to deliver the insights 
from the machine learning algorithm that is trustworthy, trustworthy and it is provided with evidence that algorithm is looking at these signals. You can look for yourself. If you were the algorithms, you would have come to the same conclusion. And that's where the trust starts. And operators start taking action, taking their truck to the workshop. Otherwise, if they don't trust, I, I, I see the truck is fine. I don't see this truck, truck failing in like 24 hours. This machine learning alg algorithm is shit. Yeah. What, so, what's, what's interesting is that those, sh those stories get out there. So you talk about multi mind site, right? It, in, in, in mind, what, what's really interesting is even though there may be very different types of operations that are driven um, by different profiles, in the end, there are common themes, whether they're safety or planning or fragmentation or reliability-centered maintenance. And one of the things that we've had a lot of success with is really setting up centers of excellence from, from people across multiple sites and, and seeding those with digital technologists and really looking at the macro view of the problem and then taking point problems in the operations to solve and then letting that team figure out what the priority was. So it was no longer sites fighting for investment. It was like, hey, we're going after this problem for our business and we're going to apply it everywhere it exists. And, and what happened was we started getting a lot more learning and best practices across the groups. And, and, and literally we have people calling us, say, hey, when can I get that solution pulled in from my site? Which was totally different than any experience we've ever had before. So it's, it's, it's very, th these opportunities of these common platforms and, and common ways of, of, of understanding the problem, and then really taking technologies that people see in their consumer life and applying it to these problems that we really never could solve in a lot of ways uh, in mining up until the last few years. So it's exciting. It definitely is. And I'm going to follow up on Caleb's point to you, to you, Bert, on this, is that uh, it all comes down to EBITDA. Everything is for the purpose of increasing the earning for the organization, delivering more shareholder value. Every effort should be in that line, and that's probably the binding thread across the site and across the HQ. That's, I think, one single you know, thread that binds all the beats together, that we are all serving the same cause. So what do you think are the, are the main drivers of that earnings, and if you could please uh, break that down into like productivity or availability or reliability, what in your experience, what have you found is, uh, what you have found is the most valuable deliverable on that point? The, the most valuable what? The most valuable metric that can deliver value on EBITDA or earnings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so I, I mean, I think each site, depending on where it is in its cycle, is, is going to be different. For the business, we understand what it is, so we have the KPIs at the business level, and each site understands how it contributes to those. So a site that's much lower grade, right, is somewhat more marginal, but is producing for the, hopefully, the, the uptick in the cycle, right, they're, they're very cost focused. Right? Whereas some of the, our sites that have a lot more growth potential, a lot more brownfield potential, they're, they're looking at, at the problems differently. But across the business, during each time in the cycle, what we're coming to, to uh, agreement across all the projects is around uh, our, our current theme is uh, what we call America's Concentrator, which is producing out of the same assets across the business, creating a, a virtual concentrator which will essentially offset the opportunity to have to build one ourselves. Um, and everyone can rally around that. So if I can go get 5% out of this concentrator, 10% out of this concentrator, and I look at the downstream impacts and I look at the upstream impacts, now all of a sudden I have to mine more ore to fill the concentrator. Right? So everybody has their piece, and, and it's a rallying point. And, and it's the 18-month it's the vision for our business and, and, and having that in everybody's <coughs> head, each of the sites are rallying around that focus. Got it. So uh, con continuing on the, on the KPIs or the key performance indicators, the ends. Um, so Bert talked about the operational metrics, is that each site has a different operational requirements and priorities and preferences, and th they need to be respected because that's a unique, uh, genuine d differences. Um, in terms of safety, um, which is, um, we, we started this, this conference in asking the question, who starts the first meeting, and you were the first person to raise the hand, yes. Every meeting starts with safety briefing. W what is your experience with safety 
and how technology is able to, to improve it? Look, I think um, safety has been in the mining industry forever and a day, and I think we heard some really good comments about safety this morning and how safety can drive value. I think we have an obligation on our, um, on, on our leadership teams to go and sit back and rethink the way that we articulate safety to attribute value to the organization. Safety has become one of these things that everyone in the mining industry says, yes, we do it, yes, we do it, but you know, do you really do it? Does everyone live that every day? And I think understanding how safety adds value and, and us as a leadership team articulating how safety adds, adds value to the organization is, is critical. Um, you know, we, uh, we've actually taken uh, recently a nutrient in, in our pot uh, potassium or potash uh, business. We've taken a bit of a step back and we said, let's look at safety and how this actually adds value. And, and not just the, I would say, the lagging indicators, but some of those leading indicators as well where, you know, um, where, where you actually mitigate incidents and what that could have been. And I think we, we sometimes look only after the fact what safety, you know, what safety could do for us, but looking ahead and saying, this is what safety can do and how it can mitigate uh, you know, and create value, essentially, is really important. And as a, as, as a, as a result, for our digital transformation program, uh, you know, one of the banners that you have, if you essentially go into your metrics and say, um, this house is going to create value, of course, you've got EBITDA, you've got productivity, you've got all the operational metrics there, but then you've got safety or enabler as a metric as well and saying, this is how this is gonna change culture or this is how this is gonna improve my safety. And there's an actual metric that adds value to that because too often safety gets deprioritized over EBITDA or you know, productivity, cost, efficiency, et cetera. So to answer your question, how does technology help safety? I think there's a huge benefit in, in uh, technology bringing safety you know, higher. Um, one example would be if you think about reliability and how uh, technology adds to the reliability. Um, you know, I believe, and, and we honestly believe in, in Nutrien, that the more reliable your operations are, the safer your people are, and overall there's higher productivity. So uh, as an example at Nutrien, we, we have um, you know, large machines running a kilometer underground. Um, these machines will uh, run 6,000 feet one way, turn around, do it again, turn around and do it again. And I, I, being able to stabilize the operations there and decrease your variability using technology, like advanced process controlling and automation, sig significant improvements in your productivity, reliability, and ultimately, you've not only removed people from the face and the most dangerous area underground, but you've also now stabilized all those activities that uh, you know, we heard a little bit about this morning, short-term interval control, where you now don't need people to go and intervene or react um, because the stability is there and, and technology has actually enabled that. And dr that drives huge value for the organization. And I think, I think we as, uh, as leaders need to redefine how safety actually adds value indirectly and directly. And it also, the technology also adds the predictability in the operation. Absolutely, yes. you are You are sure that nothing is going to come at me surprisingly. Like it's it's trans to... transparency of, of you know, what to expect, absolutely. Exactly. And, and I think machine learning becomes really important there because that's where you get the opportunity to, to start becoming better at predicting, predicting what okay. might happen and also value creation from that. I just want to complement that point. Um, I think fundamentally, we as miners need to look at how we redesign our businesses to eliminate risk. Mm. Right? It's not about mitigating risk. It's about designing our businesses to remove risk. And technology is an absolute enabler to that. Because right? I completely agree with things. It's we look at safety as a secondary element. And I don't think that's good enough. Right? Oftentimes, we're driven by EBITDA. Many of us have been in, in, in conversations where we need to look at a new ground, uh, greenfield development as an example. And, and, and the first part of the conversation is always, how can you make this project positive, NPV positive, safely? That's typically how it's approached. Right? But fundamentally, those two things need to go hand in hand. And I would argue, if we start to have the conversation about how do we make these operations safer, how do we eliminate risk? 
at a positive MPV. I think it allows us to look at the designs of our operations very, very differently than we look at them today. Right? That, in my point of view, can become the catalyst for true transformation. We talked about that earlier in, in the opening remarks. I think as we pursue EBITDA and productivity, it becomes very easy for that value to, mm -hmm. to be leaked. Right? That's one of the things we're struggling with, where I can quantify the value associated with any given initiative, and they're all very, very positive. But at the overall, at the top line or bottom line of the organization, we're seeing costs going up, we're seeing headcount increasing, we're seeing you know, all of the things that, that most of you are, are struggling with day in and day out. And yet, the technology program's extremely robust and <laughs> very profitable. Right? If you look at the catalyst for change in other industries, we need to find something similar in ours, and perhaps risk and sustainability become that catalyst to, to transform our industries in ways that we haven't yet thought about. So to, to your point on sustainability, so the answer my question to you is, from sustainability and what do we call the social license to operate, is my, my personal feeling is that mining is unnecessarily over defensive about the safety and sustainability. We are so defensive, we always try to defend ourselves, we, we should not. Uh, but apart from that, how do you see sustainability and the social license of license to operate getting changed by enabling new business models, new technologies? Look, uh, I would go the other way. I'd say that it's not about continuously trying to drive the social license. It's, it's about if we are not socially responsible, we will not be able to attract the talent of the future that we need to continue to do mining. If you look at the younger generation, the things they look for is not only a challenging job where they can make an impact and all, you know, everything else that you hear, but they are honestly looking at, you know, is this a sustainable operation? And, th and this is a thing, that's a theme that's happening. I think from a, from a sustainability piece and, and, and a safety perspective as well, you know, one of the things that we in the industry, I, I would say, don't take advantage enough of is every mining company that I know of talks about safety as, as a commitment. It's either in their charter values or, you know, somewhere in your values as an organization. If executives are not committed to, to real safety or sustainability, it will not happen. So, you know, we, um, in all levels of the organization, has a, have a responsibility to look at how can we make operations more safe, more sustainable. But the thing that we can do also is we can tap into that charter value of sustainability and safety and hold our leaders accountable for that. And I think we're starting to see this from the ground up, where we've got some of the younger generation saying, but we talk about safety and we talk about innovation as another one, uh, as, as part of our charter values, how are we doing that? I want to see the commitment from, from the executive team. I want to see leadership actually living this. So I think the owners are going to be put back on companies from their own people to become more sustainable, to be more safe. And I think, you know, uh, it, it's almost a little bit like technology. It's happening. You know, we, we better get in front of that. Otherwise, we will be left behind. But <clears throat> particularly on the... Uh the greenhouse gas piece, diesel accounts for a huge portion of that in our hall. And unless we move to some sort of elect electrification in that area uh, and electrification from renewable uh, sources, um, that's not going to really change in the foreseeable future. But what's more important, and I think we touched on this earlier, is having, having some vision of a mind that is different. And that vision actually informs plans that are made today. So when, you know, when you're buying a large piece of haul equipment, that will last 10 to 15 years. And that locks you in to a certain mode of operation. You can't change it. And so now is the time to take risk in certain, certain areas to really explore what the options are because a lot of, perhaps, uh, some of your equipment is beginning to age. And if you're gonna buy the same old yellow truck, that's exactly what's going to happen. In 10 to 15 years, you'll still be running that truck because you can't not run it. And running mixed fleet, fleets, as we all know, is, is not a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, experience. And so, you know, there are very large-scale decisions in these very, very large assets that get made early on and that lock you in. 
They lock countries into how they generate power. They lock mining companies and mines into how they operate. And so when these opportunities occur, we have to be, we have to be able to actually take risks and make very different decisions. And I think that that's one of the, the key issues here. Even, even on automated haul, for example. So we have very large automated haul trucks. Why? You know, the, the main cost here, the driving cost, has is, is literally been driven out, so to speak. And so, you know, if you run a very small truck, you all of a sudden have a far lower cost of maintenance, far smaller cost of tires. You can actually work with the regulators to really constrain the size of the road. You have a much uh, steeper um, grade. You have um, an ability to actually run the mine differently operated with surge loaders, actually introducing capacitance into the circuit that used to be sort of a, a, point, a point load uh, circuit. And, and, and so thinking broadly about sort of large scale process changes based on innovation takes the courage of risk because that risk is going to last with you for 10 to 15 years. Just buying the same old large haul truck and, and, and um, having a, a fairly low level of autonomy in it, you know, that's pretty safe, but at the same time, how much is it really buying us as a, as a, as a, com as a company, as a community, to reduce greenhouse gases to actually operate differently? And it's, a, it's a good point. I just want to add on to that, and this is where the innovation <coughs> agenda comes in for an organization. It comes back to how committed are yeah. companies to innovation, because it's not about just capital dollars being spent into innovation, it's also about new capabilities that's required, new ways of thinking that's required, and I, we haven't touched on that today a whole lot, but that is critically important to enable this innovation, creating a culture where it is safe to fail because you will not succeed the first time necessarily. And, and where most of us operate in brownfield environments, you don't have the luxury of just going redesigning something new that's in a green field. So some capital is already there. How do you take advantage of innovation? And, and I think that's, that's critically important. Yeah. So, so I was still, uh, just picking something from what Tian just said about uh, the cultural aspect of change and change management. Um, I know that this is a dreaded term for, for some. <laughs> but how, how have you seen that affecting the progress of implementation of new technologies or new, new business models? Like, how sensitive you need to be with that, and how do you, sometimes you have to be just assertive and say, no, it is done. Forget about the change management aspect. I mean, look, change, change management, we'll all say, it's, it's fundamental to this process, right? Um, but I'm not talking about the, the academic change management exercises that, uh, you know, that many of the consulting companies talk to us about. I'm talking about real change on the ground. Um, you know, it starts with, with that ownership from, from the business areas around the outcomes that they want to achieve and a relentlessness to achieve those outcomes, right? And that goes to Thien's point that we need, to, we need to move the innovation agenda and we need to be willing to, to take those risks around the innovation agenda, which means keeping your sight on the outcome that you're trying to achieve and then relentlessly pursuing it, even recognizing that you're going to stumble along the way and be willing to redirect. But as far as change goes, it's, as I said, it, it is fundamental. Um, I think it starts, as I said, with that ownership, but I think it also requires us to approach the solutioning to these problems very, very different. A lot of us, you know, a lot of this conversation has been about technology enablement. But we need to have the, the business process team fully engaged in that, in that process. You need to have the HR team fully engaged in that process. We need to be looking at how we change our incentives, for example, to promote this type of innovation and risk taking. If we, if we simply incent, for example, in a brownfield operation, if we simply incent you're going to get your bonus if you hit your production targets. Guess what? No one's going to innovate because hitting the production targets day in and day out is really bloody hard. So why does anybody in the front line want to take additional risk if they're not motivated and incented to do that? Right? And so answering you, I don't think it can be, 
I think occasionally you can take an approach of top down and say, look, these are the things that we will pursue. But I've rarely seen those, that approach be successful. Ultimately, you need to get the buy-in from the operations. Uh, you need to get the buy-in from the frontline workforce that will affect those changes. And there's ways of getting that. Yeah, it's like your idea, but it has to come from them. Well, yeah. that, that's right. That's right. I mean, I heard a, a, a great quote uh, recently that, that I think is so apropos to this problem is, uh, you know, the, the problem with communication is the illusion that it occurred, right? And, and too often we think, oh, we sent out a memo, we posted on the web, or we had, a, we had a team meeting and I communicated. But communication is one way, right? The, the ability to get an understanding of what the key objectives are, what it means to me, and really get people on board and get the messaging on all dimensions of what it means, you know, and then l allow them to take it down to their staff. And that, that's a huge investment, and, but that's what gets the alignment. And I'm, I'm of the opinion over the last few years that instead of 80% technology, 20% commun uh, communication and, and change, it, it needs to be flipped. Once people understand why you're doing what you're doing and, and it's good for them and it's good for the business, they're ready to change. And they we have themselves. not done a good job of, of, exactly. of doing that in our business. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Perfect. I think that that's a, that's a very good uh, statement for, for the closing. Uh, we have come to a close. Uh, I just got a warning about the time up. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, it was wonderful talking to you. We are now open for the questions, if there are any. It's a couple. Not really. Thank you. Um, Ash, very insightful panel, and uh, thanks for, for the guests. Uh, the question here is, an uh, earlier panel had a show of hands of suppliers and uh, um, operating companies. Uh, we have some very distinguished guests from the operator side. In this uh, period of moving to Industry 4.0 with more collaboration, what role do you see suppliers, and less about the technology, but more about people and process within making some of the changes that you're trying to achieve? Thank you. If I can take that, actually. So my, my background, I actually came from consulting. Uh, interestingly enough, I worked many years in consulting, started my career as an entrepreneur, and then went into consulting. So, um, you know, when I was, when I was r running uh, practices and consulting, fundamentally, I, you know, I'm very familiar with the metrics. And many of the metrics are very similar across all services companies, product companies, et cetera. We talk about collaboration, and it's funny, a lot of the consulting companies, when they're advising us about digital, <laughs> they talk to us about open innovation, ecosystems, collaboration, multidisciplinary teams. I can probably rhyme off a number of other buzzwords that I'm sure you're all familiar with, but I would ask the question back to the suppliers, how do you guys really practice that? Right? I think a lot of the um, contractual structures fundamentally get in the way to real collaboration and partnership. Mm -hmm. And you could argue maybe it's coming from us. I think it's also coming from the organizations, and I think we need to work through that a little bit to really try and enable true partnership and collaboration, right? Risk taking, joint investments, those kinds of things I think are gonna be fundamental. I think there's a spectrum as well. So there's a very large spectrum of suppliers, as you know. And uh, they provide many different kinds of services and goods. And as a result, uh, you know, it's a very broad question as to, well, uh, you know, how do we use them? Well, we use them all the time because certainly um, uh, in a cyclical industry, you, you can't staff to the peaks. So you will always have to staff to some level of, of capability beyond your internal capability, uh, both from a contractual point of view and a consulting point of view, as well as a, pro as well as a goods prov provider point of view. One of the problems that we have come across is certainly on the software side, the software platforms are evolving so fast and, and when I'm saying fast, it's like six months, six weeks at a time. I was going to say six months. That's way too um, optimistic in many cases. That, that the response time, particularly in, in mining, no matter what area of mining, it just isn't that kind of, of, of pace. And it's not that we would like to say slow down. It's that, that even you can't slow down. And, and, and sometimes the push is actually from our providers who provide us with our base capabilities in these platforms. And it, 
even, even in the case of cybersecurity, you can't slow down. You just have to keep on going, and that's actually increased our costs. And I think that uh, many of the, of the providers really have to be conscious that this increase in cost is seen as a cost. It's not seen as an EBITDA increase. And it's an incredibly difficult problem for, I think, the companies to absorb. Uh, this is a kind of a follow-on to that question. Um, I'm Martin Lurie with Tiss and Krupp, and like many uh, OEMs, we have quite a full pipeline of innovations. Some of them are not digital and require pilot plans to demonstrate, and some of them are sufficiently innovative that they need that pilot plan in order to get buy-in. And I'd like to ask members of the panel if you've seen good models uh, for collaboration between uh, OEMs and mining companies to get across that chasm of building the pilot plan, funding it, getting buy-in, and demonstrating the technology? All right. I think there are, are many. I'll, ask, I'll answer that one because we are involved in a number of different ventures. Uh, one is through a venture capital company in Canada called Chrysalix. And uh, in that, sen in that uh, case, uh, we, we partnered uh, with Chrysalix, uh, and Chrysalix has, has uh, invested in a company called MindSense that actually um, determines what kind of ore we're, we're digging. Uh, and, and through those kinds of mechanisms, I think that uh, it's actually quite possible to, and, and we have, in fact, looked at pilot plants and, and other, uh, other very innovative capabilities. Um, I think that there are uh, an awful lot of, there's an awful lot of potential out there in very important areas like comminution or like, like fracturing rock without, without blasting uh, that really have to be addressed because those are areas where comminution, for example, is, is, is the bane of mining. You know, 1% efficiency, 3% of the world's energy. That, I mean, to, to, to break big rock into little rock. I mean, what, what are we really doing here? So, awful lot of opportunity, very innovative ideas coming forward, um, and I think that we just, again, have to be uh, consistent in taking risk from the top down. Yeah, and I, and I think what's unique to our industry in that space is, as you well know, you know, we have these, these assets that, that are built for 30, 40 year lives, and, yeah. and, and how do we use innovation and, and truly understand um, how we can get more return on invested capital without necessarily a full swap and replacement. And I think that's a, a natural conflict we have with a lot of the OEMs because they're invested in, in selling that next asset. And so I think a, a good balance will, will really help move that, the, the industry forward. So in the interest of time, I know we could keep going on this panel for the rest of the day, um, and we should have called it demystifying digitization, because I think you guys did a brilliant job of just turning it into something really pragmatic. So brilliant job, kudos to all of those conversations. Um, I'll look forward to changing your opinion on consultants, though. Just, just saying, you know, we're the guys who get it done on the ground, coaching, guiding. Okay, um, thank you, Ash, really appreciate it.